it was the site of some of the war's most iconic moments yet. Lying just a few dozen kilometers from Odessa, Tiny Snake Island appears an unprepossessing place, a mere speck of rock amid the waters of the Black Sea. Yet in over six months of conflict, it is already featured at the heart of some of the war's biggest stories. It was here that Ukrainian defenders uttered the now immortal line, a Russian warship, go f yourself. In the nearby sea, that the battleship Moskva was sunk while defending the island's airspace. Here, too, that Ukraine scored one of their great propaganda victories when Russian forces were pressed into retreat and the yellow and blue flag was raised once again. Yet, despite all this coverage, mysteries remain. With equipment losses estimated at close to $1 billion, why did Russia expend so much material holding this lump of rock? And how did Snake Island come to occupy such an important place in both nations' narratives? Today, War of Graphics is detailing the story of the Battle of Snake Island and how this tiny place came to have such an outsized impact. Although Snake Island, or to give it its proper name, Zmini Ostrov, only exploded into global consciousness following Russia's 2022 invasion of Ukraine, the signs had been growing for a while that this unimpressive rock was a future flashpoint. In Russia, prominent ultranationalists like Alexander Dugin were starting to wax lyrical about its sacred geography, the mystical quality that allowed its owners to influence history. In the West, meanwhile, military analysts were starting to wargame invasion scenarios and noting that Russian weapons stationed there could cut off Ukrainian ships from the Black Sea. Clearly, people invested in the futures of Ukraine and Russia were paying close attention to the island. Which means this video should probably begin with the most simple question of all. What really is it? The answer to that question is just not much. At a mere 0.2 kilometers or just under 50 acres, Snake Island is barren flat and historically useless. Sitting 35 kilometers away from the coasts of both Ukraine and Romania, it spent much of the past being ignored, with no deposits to mine, no fresh water to sustain life, and nothing in the way of local wildlife, including snakes, ironically. There was simply no point in anybody settling there. Now, that's not to say it never attracted human attention. Way back in ancient times, a shrine to Achilles stood on the island, and it occasionally saw lighthouses built to guide ships into the Greek city of Olbia. In modern times, though, it was mostly used as a pawn for warring powers to trade. In the early 19th century, that meant the Ottoman Empire handing it over to Imperial Russia. In 1878, that meant the newly created Kingdom of Romania taking ownership, something that lasted right up to 1948. Well, technically. In reality, World War II saw the USSR chase away the Romanian garrison and establish its own control over Snake Island. This is probably why ultranationalists like Dugin venerate the place. The war saw the Soviets use their occupation to dominate the Northwest Black Sea, thereby linking the islands to Russia's patriotic war narrative. Still, this didn't stop the island from following Kiev out of the USSR's exit in 1991. Not that independent Ukraine had much use for it. The only advantage it really conferred was to extend Ukraine's exclusive economic zone further into the waters known to be rich in undersea oil and gas deposits. Hence, neighboring Romania's attempt in the early 2000s to have Snake Island reclassified as a rock and therefore too small for any nation to lay claim to. But then came 2014 and Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. A mere 289 kilometers from the stolen peninsula, Snake Island suddenly became both an advantage to Kiev and a major vulnerability. An advantage because it could now be used as an outpost for monitoring Russian activity in Crimea, complete with a radar station and air defense systems. And a vulnerability because it now represented the key to keeping Ukraine's ports open. As we've all learned since the war started, Ukraine is a major exporter of grain, most of which is sent on ships via the Black Sea. Among the most important ports are Odessa and Kherson, ports which require ships to pass near Snake Island to get where they're going. Hence, Western analysts raising warnings that Russia might one day try to seize the island. Hence, a 2021 visit by Vladimir Zelensky, who declared, this island, like the rest of our territory, is Ukrainian land, and we will defend it with all our might. This all could the former comedian have known that Moscow would soon put his promise to the test.
Despite Zelensky's fighting words, the size of the actual garrison stationed to Snake Island showed how Kiev really felt about defending it. As the sun set on the tense evening of February the 23rd, 2022, with war now mere hours away, it was over a Snake Island defended by fewer than 100 people. The likely reason for this is that no one realistically expected the garrison to repel an attack. While within range of fighter jets launched from Crimea, it was predicted to fall to Russia within hours of a conflict starting, and that's exactly what happened. At 5 a.m. on February the 24th, Vladimir Putin appeared on television to announce a special military operation against Kiev, an ongoing euphemism for a mad imperial war of conquest. Minutes after he finished speaking, missiles struck Ukrainian cities. At the borders, Russian tanks, trucks, and helicopters poured over in an all-out assault. On Snake Island itself, all the guards could do was sit back and wait for the inevitable. That afternoon, a giant appeared on the horizon. The Russian Black Sea Fleet's flagship cruiser, Moskva, was approaching. Backed by the patrol ship Vasily Baikov, it was to provide cover while the 810th Independent Marine Guards Brigade overran the island. By now, Snake Island had already been hit with airstrikes, as far as anyone can tell, taking it was considered merely a small formal step in Russia's larger plan to stage a landing in Odessa. As the Moskva approached, it sent the Ukrainian garrison a simple message. I suggest you lay down your weapons and surrender to avoid bloodshed and needless casualties. Otherwise, you will be bombed. And so, we come to one of the most iconic moments of trash talking in the history of warfare. In response, 31-year-old Ukrainian border guard Roman Khribrov took the radio and declared, Russian warship, go f yourself. It was a moment that became not just a meme, but a catchphrase, a motto, a slogan, one that showcased Ukraine's defiance in the face of an overwhelming enemy. Which is all the more remarkable when you realize Hrybov subsequently surrendered. Despite initial reports that all Snake Island's border guards had been killed flipping the mosque for the bird, it later turned out 82 of them had agreed to lay down arms. A fact that only came to light after they'd been posthumously declared heroes of Ukraine. Not that anyone could accuse them of cowardice. Roman Hrybov later spoke about his experience as a POW, and it's clear the border guards suffered for their defiance. Initially kept in a tent encampment in the blisteringly cold Ukrainian winter, the men were subject to cruel psychological games. At one point, the Russians tied nooses around their necks so tight they could barely breathe and then drove them to the countryside, leaving Hrybov certain that they'd be executed. He later said of the experience, we were treated worse than dogs. Thankfully, none of his jailers knew who had actually told the Moskva to do unspeakable things to its own backside. Had they known, his captivity would likely have been worse. In the end, though, Hrybov was freed, along with some of the other border guards in a prisoner swap. By then, though, his words were famous. As many have pointed out, it's remarkable that the last stand on Snake Island became such a powerful piece of propaganda. After all, it was a failure. Russia seized the island the first day of the invasion. Nor was it some kind of Ukrainian Alamo. The defenders surrendered and were captured. Yet, like the other noble failures before it, Dunkirk, for example, that evening on Snake Island went down in legend. Not the tale of a minor Ukrainian defeat, but a symbol of something larger, of defiance in the face of Putin's war machine. Now Kiev just needed to win the island back. The island in their possession, the invading Russian force set about turning it into a fortress, a place bristling with weapons. This meant installing powerful Tor and Pantsir air defense systems to take out Ukrainian counterattacks capable of knocking drones and planes out of the sky with ease. It also meant keeping the Moskva close. Sending a massive warship to take one tiny island was always overkill, but now the Moskva continued to patrol the waters near Snake Island, adding its own air defense umbrella. And what an umbrella it was. Armed with an S-300F missile system, the ship was basically a floating double battery, one that lurked 55 kilometers offshore, providing cover not just to Snake Island, but to the other ships gathering in the area. With the Moskva's protection, there was little chance of Ukraine's drones damaging any Russian vessel, and that effectively handed Putin control of the Northwest Black Sea. As Ukraine's defense intelligence chief despairingly noted, whoever controlled Snake Island controlled the surface and to some extent the air situation in southern Ukraine. That meant Russia being able to effect a blockade, strangling the Ukrainian economy and causing chaos on the world's grain markets. Not that the blockade was projected to last very long. From the moment Snake Island fell, Russian forces began preparing for a landing in Odessa, one which they believed 
would see the port city quickly capitulate. Remember, these were still the early days of the war. The days when the world still assumes the armored column driving towards Kiev would force the city's surrender rather than become target practice for Ukraine's forces. When it was still assumed that Russia would overrun the entire country. In the northwest, Black Sea Theater, that meant Odessa was next on the menu. Rapucha class landing ships were soon appearing near Snake Island. Admiral Grigorovich class frigates began patrolling the Odessa shore. Exercises were undertaken, preparing for an assault, one the Ukrainians could do little about. At the outset of the war, the Ukrainian Navy had already been unimpressive. Now it was mostly lying on the bottom of the sea, either sunk or deliberately scuttled. The only card left to play was to mine the waters surrounding Odessa. Although it paid off in the sense that the anticipated Russian landing never came, it didn't solve the fundamental problem of the blockade. On top of that, intelligence was being shared that Russia would soon install a long-range air defense S-400 system on Snake Island, one that could command the skies over Ukraine's entire southern coast. In short, it was a desperate situation. Luckily, it was one in which Russia had already made a spectacular error. We mentioned a moment ago how the Moskva's role in taking Snake Island was overkill. Here was a massive cruiser designed to destroy aircraft carriers a thousand kilometers away, with P-1000 Vulcan anti-ship missiles slumming it and being sworn at by Ukrainian border guards. Yet overkill wasn't the only way to describe the Moskva's presence. It was also an unnecessary risk. On March the 24th, Ukraine managed to successfully penetrate Russia's air defenses, blowing up the smaller ship Orsk while it was in port in the occupied city of Berdyansk. At the time, it was Russia's biggest naval loss in decades, and it was a huge embarrassment. But rather than be all like, mm, guess we'd better keep our expensive warships further away from Ukrainian lines, commanders were like, Ukraine? Sink the Moskva? Ah, please, next to be telling me the vodka isn't food. With nothing in Ukraine's arsenal thought capable of taking down the flagship, it was allowed to keep patrolling near Snake Island, as confident in its invulnerability as a bristling porcupine. But, of course, when the wolves are desperate enough, sometimes even porcupines become prey. On May the 27th, 1905, Japanese torpedo boats succeeded in doing the unthinkable. During the Battle of Toshima, they managed to sink the Knyaz Suvorov, the flagship of Imperial Russia's 2nd Pacific Squadron. We mention this because that afternoon marked the last time a Russian flagship was sunk during wartime for a long, long time. Until April the 13th, 2022, to be precise. That's because April the 13th, 2022 was the day Ukraine at last managed to destroy the Moskva. Almost five months later, the details of what happened remain sketchy. Russia Russia insists that a combination of a storm at sea and a fire combined to cause a horrific accident. But this is so unlikely, they might as well blame the sinking on witches. No. The real controversy is whether Ukraine, as Kiev claimed, managed to hit the warship with their own Neptune anti-ship missiles or whether longer-range Western weapons were used. Regardless, the result was the same. The Moskva went oh, under the waves, the biggest Russian naval loss since World War II, and their first flagship sunk during wartime in nearly 120 years. With her uh, went an unknown number of sailors, possibly as few as one, possibly as many as 250. But also something else, the Navy's sense of invulnerability. The destruction of the Moskva didn't just generate a tsunami of memes, it led to a change in naval strategy, to the Black Sea fleet pulling away from Ukraine's coastline, back towards the safety of Crimea. That meant the Moskva's lost air defense umbrella wasn't replaced. Instead, the Russian garrison on Snake Island would have to rely on its own anti-aircraft systems. In theory, this should have been fine. The TOR system, also known as the SA-15 Gauntlet, that they had is famous as a drone killer. Or at least it was, because Ukraine was about to challenge that reputation with one of their newest weapons, the Bayraktar TB-2. Made by Turkey, the Bayraktar TB-2 falls into the category of medium-altitude, long-endurance drones with the slightly odd abbreviation, MAIL. Effectively, an attempt to do for Turkey's UAV industry what the MQ-9 Reaper did for America's, the Bayraktar is less sophisticated. It's slow-moving with a smallish payload, and it lacks a lot of the Reaper's fancy communication software. But what it does have is an 
excellent track record. While the US has mostly used its drones for taking out militants and accidentally bombing weddings, turkeys have been deployed to serious war zones. Ankara sent them after the Kurds in Syria, used them to harass Russian air defense systems in Libya, where Moscow was backing a rival warlord. Most strikingly, Bayraktar TB2s helped Azerbaijan in the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war against Armenia, a war that Azerbaijan won as decisively as Thanos won in Infinity War. So Ukraine clearly had high hopes when they signed an agreement with Turkey to produce 48 of the drones, deploying the first in combat against Russian separatists in Donbass in October 2021. Even so, nobody was expecting how decisive they'd be in the battle for Snake Island. Equipped with anti-jamming equipment and armed with lightweight MAMC smart micro munitions capable of traveling 8 kilometers, TB2s were soon buzzing over the Black Sea. Their first strike came on May 2, 2022. That day, missiles slammed into a pair of Raptor-class boats near the island, destroying them both. The twin strike was another embarrassment for the Russian Navy, a warning that their air defense systems clearly weren't up to the task of replacing the Moscow's powerful umbrella. Yet it seems likely that the Russians simply assumed this was another fluke, another infuriating instance of Ukraine getting lucky. It was only after another four days had passed that the Snake Island garrison realized how screwed they were. On May the 6th, TB2s struck Snake Island itself, obliterating the Tor air defense system, the very same system supposedly excellent at taking down drones. Suddenly, Russian forces on the islands were unprotected and exposed. Not just sitting ducks, but ducks that had basically plucked themselves, seasoned their own skin, and helpfully climbed into the oven. Now all the Ukrainians had to do was turn the temperature up. Way up. With Snake Island's air defense system knocked out, the big challenge was stopping Russia from simply installing another. In this, Ukraine's TB2s would prove spectacularly successful. Now effectively free to operate as they wished, the drones took to simply hovering over the waters out of sight, only striking when assured of doing maximum damage. In one instance on May the 7th, that meant waiting until a boat carrying a new SA-15 was on the island's only landing ramp before blowing it to smithereens, leaving a burning wreck blocking the sole unloading point. In another, on May the 8th, that meant striking a Russian helicopter in the midst of unloading troops, causing not just material damage, but panic among the survivors. For the best parts of a week, Ukraine softened the island's defenses this way, tormenting the occupying force, refusing to give them a moment's respite. As TB2s sank assault boats and resupply craft, Su-27 fighter jets bombed the buildings on the island, taking advantage of the undefended skies to obliterate all possible shelter. Yet that week ended not with a Russian retreat, but with a new air defense system at last being installed. By May 12th, the Russian Navy had finally cleared the destroyed boat from the landing and managed to rearm Snake Island. For all Ukraine's successes, they were almost back where they were the day after the Moskva sank. But this was far from a Russian victory. In reinforcing Snake Island, Moscow had lost swathes of material. And for what? With the Moskva gone and no other warship taken over the role, the garrison remained highly vulnerable. It's tempting to think that there was a practical reason for this, but it just doesn't add up. While holding Snake Islands meant choking off the Odessa port, Russia had other options for maintaining a blockade. And with the islands now so hard to defend, the costs of maintaining a presence there far outweighed the benefits. Perhaps the navy was simply too proud to abandon something they'd captured from an enemy they deemed inferior. Perhaps the guys running the show in Moscow were simply too enamored of the sacred geography of the island. Certainly, there was no sign in late May and early June that a retreat might be on the cards. Pro-Kremlin media spent days pumping out domestic propaganda, calling Snake Island vital to the war effort. Government-aligned military experts gave interviews explaining how pro-Moscow rebels in Transnistria could be overrun by NATO forces if the island fell to Ukraine. But in the end, the decision on retreating wouldn't be Putin's to make. Instead, it would be decided over 1,500 kilometers away in Copenhagen. Around the same time Ukraine's Turkish-made drones were making mincemeat of the island's air defenses, Denmark was signing an agreement to supply Kiev with Harpoon anti-ship missiles. Capable of traveling further and more accurately than Neptune's, they would make Snake Island more vulnerable than ever, something the Ukrainians were only too happy to demonstrate. The Harpoon systems arrived around mid-June. On the 17th, two missiles were used to annihilate the Russian Navy vessel Vasily Berk as it approached the island. The 
The destruction of this ship changed the calculation in ways even the sinking of the Moskva hadn't. Beforehand, Snake Island had been dangerous to resupply. Now the act of getting ships there had crossed the line from extremely risky to actively suicidal. As drones menaced the island's defenses and harpoon missiles thudded into supply boats, the Kremlin seemed to have at last stopped drinking its own Kool-Aid. Shortly before the end of the month, the propaganda explaining the necessity of holding this rock disappeared from Russian media. On June the 30th, the Russian garrison likewise vanished from the island. Naturally, Moscow tried to spin it, claimed Snake Island had been abandoned as a gesture of goodwill. But even this cynical lie couldn't hide the truth. Ukraine had won. Snake Island could at last be recaptured. Unfortunately, this was easier said than done. After the last Russian troops left the burnt and blasted island, there was a week of emptiness, seven days of stillness in which the only movements came from grass twisting in the breeze or waves lapping at the scorched landing ramp. Peaceful as this may have been, it also represented a problem for Kiev. Russia had retreated, but their warships still patrolled the nearby waters. Snake Island remained without adequate air defense systems. Were the Ukrainians to reoccupy the site, they'd find themselves stuck in the position the Russians had been in, sitting ducks, waiting to be bombed. So the decision was made to simply make sure the island stayed abandoned, to focus on denying it to Putin rather than setting up a whole new garrison like the one that had existed before the war. Yet the Ukrainian side also knew this alone wouldn't be enough, that some symbolic act was needed to confirm the island was back in their hands. Oh, which is how the top secret operation to re-raise the flag over Zminy Ostrov was born. For a mission with no purpose beyond propaganda, it was remarkably difficult to pull off. Knowing Russia would drop a uh, Kabillion missiles on any units that went ashore, Ukraine 70 the 3rd Naval Special Purpose Center had to do nearly everything under the cover of darkness. The elite of the Navy's elite, the Special Purpose Center, or Spetsnaz, are basically Kiev's version of America's Navy SEALs, the guys who you call in to do the highly dangerous, highly specialized stuff that no one else can do. On July the 7th, 2022, that meant crossing the dozens of kilometers to Snake Island on underwater vehicles, moving carefully in case the Russians had mined the waters as a leaving present. Oh, with them traveled combat engineers of the 59th Separate Motorized Infantry Brigade, who had perhaps the most terrifying job of all. Going ashore and disabling any booby traps. It was an intense operation, one that began at night and only concluded oh, when the sun was already high in the sky. But it was also a success. That day, soldiers from Spetsnaz were photographed raising the Ukrainian flag over Snake Island for the first time since February the 24th. Taken from the air, the image wasn't quite as spectacular as that of US Marines raising the flag at Iwo Jima, but it easily carried as much meaning. Here, at last, was evidence that this sacred island belonged once again to Kiev that Russia's forces had been driven out and the occupation ended. Of course, the visit couldn't last long. Even as they were raising the flag, the soldiers were alerted to incoming Russian warships. Rather than hang around and tell them to go f themselves, the Ukrainians retreated. As they were entering the water, Russian missiles slammed into the pier. It was only through sheer luck that the Spetsnaz guys returned to the shore unscathed. In the months since that remarkable moment, Snake Island has remained pretty much where it was after the Russian retreat, back in Ukraine's hands, but too dangerous to garrison again. In some ways, this can make the successful retaking seem like a minor victory, a minor island denied to a country that already controls the much bigger Crimea. Yet, to look at things this way would be to miss the point. In the five months it held Snake Island, Russia lost almost $1 billion worth of equipment, from the sunk Moskva to the destroyed helicopter and multiple KO'd air defense systems. That's a staggering amount, and it doesn't even include the soldiers killed and wounded in Ukrainian drone strikes, nor the incalculable leverage lost over Odessa. Like so much of Russia's war of aggression, the Battle of Snake Island shows how overconfidence and a lack of preparation can turn even the easiest victory into a costly defeat. Had you swaggered up to a military analyst on February the 23rd, 2022, and told them that Moscow wouldn't even be able to hold Snake Island in an all-out conflict, they'd have thought you were hopelessly naive. And yet here we are. Now, we should probably add a caveat or two. The war, unfortunately, still isn't over at the time of recording and may not end for months or even years to come. It's not conceivable that Russia may retake this speck of rock at some future point. For now, though, it looks unlikely, and for that we can all be thankful. It may just be one tiny piece of territory in a much larger conflict, but Snake Island is also a symbol of everything that's happened so far, of Russian blunders and Ukrainian heroism, of this Slavic David giving Goliath a well-deserved bloody nose. We can only hope that when it's all finally over, Snake Island remains where it is today, a part of an independent 
and free Ukraine.